Deadly Premonition remains one of the best games I've ever played. Despite nothing like the CGI remake of Twin Peaks directed by Yu Ball, Deadly Premonition is hands down one of the most unique video games ever made, mainly due to its bizarre and surreal presentation, likeable three-dimensional characters and a memorable narrative that is worth seeing through to the end, despite nothing like an early Dreamcast game and controlling like absolute dog shit. I'm not the only one to share this opinion either, since its initial release Deadly Premonition has gone on to gain a cult status, leading to the game receiving a director's cut on both PS3 and PC in 2013 that featured a large number of quality of life improvements that made it a far more accessible experience for those trying it out for the first time. It even received a board game adaptation in 2017, raising almost three times its 50,000 dole on Kickstarter, proving that fans of Deadly Premonition hold it in such high regard that they're willing to spend nearly $150,000 just to get more of it, regardless of medium. To anyone who's ever played it, this just made sense. There's nothing else out there like Deadly Premonition. Yes, it's clearly a homage to David Lynch and Mark Frost's seminal 90s TV show Twin Peaks, with its twaint northwestern setting and murder mystery narrative, but its similarities stop there. Protagonist Francis York Morden speaks to a voice in his head called Zath, travels at random intervals into an alternate dimension filled with zombies and other horrors, and interacts with a cast of twerky characters including a travelling sapling salesman, a man in a stole mask who communicates solely through his communicator, who can only talk in rhyme. Mr. Francis York Morden, haste won't lead you to what you seek. Keep your eyes focused on your footing as we speak. So says Mr. Stoop. A woman who always walks around holding a pot, no prizes for who she potentially could be a reference to, and this creepy motherfucker who was maybe a spoopy ghost. Suffice to say, Deadly Premonition leans into the absurd with reckless abandon. York is shocked when the man in the stone mask recommends him a cereal, turkey and jam sandwich at the local diner. Mm, I can't believe it, this is fantastic. It's really good. An early puzzle in the game requires you to understand the differences between American squirrels in order to find a tea. Long tar journeys involve your having a conversation with a voice in his head about 80s B-movies. You find important clues within your morning coffee, and one particularly weird section sees you chasing a dog around the town to some of the greatest music ever composed for a video game. Contrasting this are character arts and emotional sequences that are genuinely engaging, surrealist horror segments that refuse to shy away from the disturbing and the grotesque, and a mystery narrative that is arguably better and more well-rounded than it has any right to be. On a design level, Deadly Premonition features a comprehensive routine system where every character in the game goes to work, spends time with friends and visits family, a huge number of side quests and mini-games, a Resident Evil 4 style combat system that sucks ass and is really just no good whatsoever, and a hunter tiredness and hygiene system that gives a functional reason for changing your character's outfit, as well as shaving and eating. All of this combine creates what can only be described as a fever dream of an experience that is unlike anything else you've ever played. From a traditional game design perspective, its flaws are many and hard to see through, but despite these, Deadly Premonition remains a wonderfully surreal survival horror game that has surprising emotional depth and clever design. Upon finishing Deadly Premonition, I quickly became enamoured with the director and creator of the game, Hidetata Swari Suhiro. The 45-year-old licensed Buddhist monk has been making games for just over 20 years, but it was Deadly Premonition that really put him on the map. As a centric and honest as the games he makes, Swari is known for always tarrying around his stuffed monty sidekick Sharapova, and has the most incredible bat tattoo you've ever seen of previously mentioned monty, and is known at least in my mind for his near daily Instagram posts of him drinking. He is, to put it simply, the embodiment of the Japanese auteur. I love Japanese auteurs, I love the dames they make. There's something about their work that differentiates them from prominent daming figures in the West, like Ken Levine and Tim Schafer, that's seemingly unique to those who create dames within Japan. Take Hideo Tojima, for instance. Metal Gear Solid is a seminal franchise that most people associate with Tojima as the sole creator, rather than the development teams he spearheads due to the sheer amount of influence he has over its direction. The series itself is an absurdist mishmash of Western spy fiction crossed with 80s Hollywood blockbusters, all framed through the lens of Japanese Japanese culture and their view on Western society. It's this, I think, that makes games from Japan that are influenced by Western culture so special. This blending of ideas from the perspective of the East that makes for interactive entertainment like nothing else produced here in the West. Games where super soldier clones they've graveled voice speeches about love and war before being pissed on by a guard or being instructed by their commanding officer to turn the game console off. Don't worry, it's a game. 
It's a game just like usual. You'll ruin your eyes playing so close to the TV. It's no secret that Japan as a culture has embraced absurdity far more than most Western societies. Spend five minutes searching for Japanese adverts or game shows on YouTube and it's evident that the surreal is both a tour and indeed culturally accepted theme within Japanese media. But this absurdity breeds a special kind of creative outlook that is rare in Western art. Japanese developers, more so than any other region, are less afraid to challenge the conventions of traditional video game design. Take the auto Taro, for example. <laughs> Director of last year's incredible Neo Automata, Taro used the medium of games to subvert a player's expectations about video game design as a practice through the inventive use of multiple separate playthroughs, creating a game that is a fascinating experience into existentialism and what it means to be human, despite on the surface appearing to be a game about nothing more than hitting robots over the head with swords while playing as a very angry maid. But I love Swery's work the most. Although he shares a lot in common with his fellow Japanese auteurs, Swery's games are expressive, bizarre, earnest examples of this particular style of video game design. Taking heavy influence from western mystery storylines set in rural communities, Swery's games pass these concepts through a filter of absurdity, warping and crushing expectations about the conventions of these widely used genres, but not without a smile on his face whilst doing so. That's the thing, there's joy behind these games, that's what makes them special. Since Deadly Premonition, Swery's worth has been sporadic at best. His last major game, Dark Dreams Don't Die, or D4, was released on the Xbox One in 2014. D4 was an offbeat murder mystery game filled with enthralling action sequences, great characterization, and an intriguing storyline. Originally conceived as an episodic title, D4 was cancelled early on in development and was left unfinished. Even a PC port, released shortly after the announced cancellation, didn't age enough interest to save D4. And that's a shame. Dark Dreams Don't Die was a far more competently made game from a technical standpoint when compared to Deadly Premonition, and its narrative was more tightly focused due to the episodic nature of its distribution. It's a game that could have matched the dizzying heights of its spiritual predecessor, but its lack of a conclusion hands over the whole thing, muting its narrative and leaving it feeling less like the full game and more like the prototype that was never truly expanded upon. In 2016, Swery left Access Games, a studio he co-founded in 2002, in order to take some time off for both health reasons and in order to get his arse tattooed. Again, just look at that tattoo, it's glorious. In 2017, Swery returned with the news that he had formed a new studio called White Owls and had begun working on his next project, stating that, We want to create games for you, the people who like us. Games that are bizarre, starey, grotesque and dreamlike yet also have a strange realism, games that remind you of the past, that automatal and sad yet lovable. These are the kind of games we'll be making. And that brings us to The Dud Life. The Dud Life is a debt repayment RPG set in the twinned English village of Rainy Woods. You play as Naomi, an American photojournalist who has travelled to the rural community to take pictures for a newspaper in order to repay her huge debt. Oh, also a young woman has been murdered and once a month everyone in the town turns into either a bunch of tats or a bunch of dolls. The gameplay sees you interacting with members of the town in order to solve the mystery, taking pictures and completing side tasks along the way in an effort to repay your outstanding financial burden. The Dud Life is effectively Swery's spin on Animal Crossing, and all of the hallmarks of his design style are present here. The player is an outsider in a rural town of which there is a mystery that must be solved. Naomi has a number of needs meters that must be managed. The residents of the town have their own schedule, needs and wants. The visual design is stunning too, with characters presented in an angular, papercraft style, giving the whole game an effervescent, dreamlike quality that is distinctly swery through and through. But there's a problem, one that spurred on the creation of this video and something I find particularly troubling. Doesn't look very likely that this game is going to get made. With no publisher on board, White Owls announced the Dud Life alongside a fifth funding campaign that asked fans for $1.5 million in order to cover development costs. The campaign ran for 40 days, finishing with only $700,000 in funding, less than half of what was required. Determined to keep the project alive, White Owls returned this year with a tit starter campaign, asking for the significantly reduced amount of £447,000 and 45 pence. At the time of writing this video, the campaign has reached only £275,000, around half of the funding they need, with only five days left at the time of recording. It's hard to say why the Dud Life is struggling to get funded. On the one hand, tit starter fatigue is certainly an issue, with many gamers feeling burned out from the likes of Utilele and Doddus failing to deliver on their initial promises for them to take the risk of investing in another project by a newly formed studio. Perhaps it's that, despite Deadly Premonition's told success, Swery's games remain critically divisive due to their wildly fluctuating levels of quality. Perhaps interesting and unusual aren't enticing enough factors to modern gamers. Who knows? I'm not naive. 
I'm not making this video in an attempt to pull everyone together in order to get the Dudley funded in some kind of last minute hurrah. I have a tiny reach and I accept that, but last night I received a playable prototype of the game that stole my heart so swiftly that I felt compelled to do something. Because the Dud Life is a really neat idea. Even in these early stages, the Dud Life simulated English village of Rainy Woods is a quintessential country locale. I grew up visiting villages like this. Hell, I went for lunch in one as recently as last weekend. And the Dud Life captures what makes this specific type of location so unique. It has multiple pubs serving real ales, a fish and chip shop, a number of tea rooms, and even a diff shop with sheep in the window. Have you ever been to a countryside village in the Yorkshire Dales of the Lake District? I'm telling you now, they have diff shops in their dozens and each one has a footing sheep in the window. It's always a joyous thing to see something you relate to represented in a video game, but seeing one of my favourite Japanese auteurs tattle something so close to my upbringing is enchanting. And this is the thing. This is a game about an American photographer moving to an English village created by Japanese developers. That, in of itself, gives the game a unique perspective I'm desperate to see explored further. The Dud Life feels like the game Swery has always wanted to make, too. In interviews, Swery has stated that Deadly Premonition's combat sections were a late stage addition, only included due to publisher concerns about no one wanting to play a game that lacked combat sequences. From what we've seen so far, the Dud Life is effectively the life simulator sections of Deadly Premonition expanded out into a full game. The town itself is even called Rainy Woods, a direct reference to the development code name of Deadly Premonition. Even if this never gets made, even if development stops right here, I just want to talk about the simple fact that this prototype exists. This wonderful little prototype where you're free to explore what is effectively two streets of a finely crafted English village. Taking pictures of kissing couples and alcoholic vithers is real and it's brilliant. I really want the Dud Life to succeed. Swery has recently stated that if the tith starter fails, the team will find other avenues of funding, but it's clear that they're seeking financial independence for this project. I know this doesn't always work out. I funded Doddis, for Christ's sake, I know the risks, but I really am rooting for the Dud Life. There's a link to the crowdfunding campaign in the description, maybe check it out, or at the very least, like and share this video on social media, Reddit, maybe, get the word out a little, see what people think. We live in an age where indie development is no longer a niche segment of a wider industry, where unique and interesting ideas created by small teams are no longer a rare occurrence. Perhaps this is why the Dud Life is struggling to be noticed, but what I see here is a game that has the potential of being something truly special, and that alone is reason enough for me to take to my tiny soap baths in order to try and ignite a conversation. The Dud Life looks great, and I don't want it to die. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe, I guess. If you want to see more like this, then click on the links at the end of the video. And uh, yeah, please do share this video because I think the Dud Life does deserve a second chance. And that's, well, you've just watched the video, so you know that I think that, don't you? So this makes no sense. So, bye.